Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. So far in this course, we've discussed how to solve the neutron diffusion equation analytically. These analytical solutions are useful for some quick calculations for simple systems, but in practice, we'll need to solve the diffusion equation in multi-group form for systems with a non-homogeneous composition and with some geometric complexity. The diffusion equation generally has no analytical solutions for these kinds of systems, and so we generally resort to using finite difference methods to solve the diffusion equation here. Analytical methods will solve the diffusion equation to give a flux that is a function of some smooth x, y, z, or whatever dimension the problem considers, but finite difference methods have a very different approach. Finite difference methods subdivide a system into a very large number of very small regions, and assume that the flux is constant within each individual region. If the regions are small enough, then this is a very fair assumption to make. Even though the flux is constant in each individual element, the flux in each element must still satisfy the diffusion equation, and so each element gives us one simultaneous equation for the neutron fluxes to consider. The general procedure for finite difference methods is to first generate a matrix that contains the simultaneous equations for the diffusion equation in each finite element. Next, we solve this system of simultaneous equations to determine the flux distribution across the cells. And then lastly, we iterate on this process if we are to estimate the system's eigenvalue. Don't worry if it's confusing right now, we will review this procedure in much more detail in just a few minutes. So we want to use the diffusion equation to generate an expression for the flux in some cell i, where phi of i is the flux in cell i, and s of i is the neutron source for cell i. The sigma absorption term is fairly straightforward. It just provides a coefficient that is attached to phi of i. But how can we compute the Laplacian of phi of i in our finite element? In the x dimension for a one-dimensional slab, the Laplacian is the second derivative of the flux with respect to x, which is approximately equal to the difference of the first derivatives of the flux across some delta x, which is the center-to-center -center distance for each element. In this case, we will use the first derivatives of the flux at the i plus boundary of cell i and at the i minus boundary of cell i. So what are the first derivatives of the flux? The derivative of the flux is approximately equal to the flux in the next cell minus the flux in the previous cell divided by delta x, the spacing between the cells. This means that at i plus, the first derivative of the flux is approximately equal to phi of i plus 1 minus phi of i, all divided by delta x. At i minus, the flux derivative is approximately equal to phi of i minus phi of i minus 1 divided by delta x. Once we simplify things, we find that our diffusion balance equation for cell i becomes this expression which depends on the fluxes in cells i, i plus 1, and i minus 1. If we, for example, were to repeat this process for the next cell, which is cell i plus 1, then we would find that our diffusion balance equation depends on the flux in cells i plus 1, i plus 2, and i. So if we were to repeat this process for every cell in the problem, defining these a and b coefficients for convenience, then we would generate a matrix of a and b coefficients that operates on a vector of fluxes to result in a vector of neutron source terms. Each additional simultaneous equation introduces one new variable, and we'll see that at some point we have exactly as many simultaneous equations as we have unknown flux variables. Since any cell only generates coefficients for the flux in that cell and in the two adjacent cells, we'll find that our matrix here, which is known as the M matrix, only has non-zero elements in this three-element wide diagonal area. As we'll discuss in just a few minutes, we can solve this expression and obtain the fluxes by inverting the M matrix and then by multiplying M inverse on the neutron source terms. Before we do this, let's discuss some special cases and boundary conditions. First, we'll discuss what happens at the center line cell in the problem, which is generally located at the leftmost edge of the finite elements. Because this cell is the very first cell in the problem, there is no I minus one cell available which means that there is no phi of i minus 1 available to compute the Laplacian. We need phi of i minus 1 to compute the flux derivative at the center line, so what can we do? Well, 
If we know that this is the centerline cell, then we know that the net current at this cell should equal zero at the center line. Because the current J equals negative D grad phi, this implies that the flux derivative right at the center line equals zero. And so if we zero out this flux derivative in our Laplacian, we see that our diffusion balance equation reduces to an expression that only depends on phi1 and phi2. Next, what happens in the opposite scenario, at the outermost cell in the system? In this case, there is no phi i plus 1 term available, so how can we compute the flux gradient at the outer boundary of the system? The solution is to apply the extrapolated boundary condition, which assumes that the flux equals 0 at some extrapolated distance which we have shown equals 2 times the diffusion coefficient, or more accurately, 2.1312 times the diffusion coefficient. The gradient at the outer boundary of the system is approximately equal to the flux at the extrapolated location, which equals 0, minus the flux in the last cell, all divided by delta x for this expression, which here equals the extrapolation distance, or 2 times the diffusion coefficient. And thus, by using the definition of the extrapolated boundary condition, our Laplacian and diffusion equation yield this expression, which only depends on the flux in the last and in the second to last cells. Next, we'll talk about what to do at material interfaces. When we use Fick's law to compute the current at an interface, we must multiply the gradient, and thus the derivative, of the fluxes by some diffusion coefficient. But what happens if cells 1 and cells 2 contain different materials? Should we use the diffusion coefficient for cell 1 or for cell 2? The solution is to compute an average diffusion coefficient at the interface, which equals the flux weighted average of the two diffusion coefficients. Now, we're trying to use this diffusion coefficient to solve for the neutron fluxes, which also appear in this expression for the neutron diffusion coefficient. So this makes things a little bit more complicated. In practice, we actually won't use this expression and we'll generally simplify things so that our interface average diffusion coefficient is simply just the average of the d1 and d2 diffusion coefficients. As our finite elements get smaller and smaller, this approximation should introduce less and less error. So now that we've finished discussing our boundary conditions, let's up the ante by discussing how to solve these equations for a multi-dimensional system. The short answer is that we solve them exactly the same, except that our gradient contains more terms. Here for this 2D example, it would contain both an x and y second-order derivative for this 2D system. The i and j directions denote the flux in the x and y dimensions, and thus the Laplacian in the x dimension depends on phi of ij, phi of i plus 1 in j, and phi of i minus 1 in j. The Laplacian in the y dimension depends on phi of i and j, phi of i and j plus 1, and phi of i and j minus 1. And so when all is said and done, we arrive at this expression, which now contains both delta x and delta y terms. The last stop in our whirlwind tour of finite difference methods will cover how to compute the Laplacian in non-Cartesian geometries, here in cylindrical coordinates. For this coordinate system, we can generally assume that our system is symmetric around theta, and we can also compute the Laplacian with respect to z using the standard approach for Cartesian coordinates. But how do we handle this radial term? Well, if we look at the definition for the Laplacian in radial coordinates, we see that for some cell i that is spaced out delta r from the i plus 1 and i minus 1 cells, we see that the 1 minus r term on the outside simply becomes ri, which is the location of the center of cell i. From there, we need to compute r times d phi dr at the i plus and the i minus boundaries of cell i. When we do this, the r terms in this inner expression become r at i plus and r at i minus, respectively, and the first derivative of the fluxes is computed using the same difference method that we use for Cartesian coordinates. All in all, the M matrix for cylindrical geometry systems will be slightly more complicated than for Cartesian systems since the coefficients in each simultaneous equation in the M matrix will depend on that cell's radius and then also on the R plus and RI radii for that cell. The M matrix is a little bit more difficult to compute here, but once we have it, our finite element problem is solved exactly the same way. Lastly, let's discuss how to estimate the source term for each cell. 
This term seems simple at first. It simply equals new sigma fission times the flux in cell i, but things get complicated because this term contains phi i, which is exactly what we're trying to solve for. So what do we do? The solution is to solve for the fluxes and the system eigenvalue iteratively. The general process for solving a finite difference diffusion problem begins with setting an initial guess for the flux in each cell. A very reasonable and very common guess is to assume that the flux is uniform across the cells. After we set the initial flux guess, we'll need to renormalize the flux so that the fission rate in our system equals the system's known fission rate. This renormalization step is something that we'll repeat multiple times during our iterations. The second step is to actually solve for the flux. Given our operator notation for the diffusion equation, we can rearrange terms to solve for the flux in some n plus 1 iteration by having the inverse of the m matrix operate on the neutron source vector, where again the source vector is determined by using the flux from the previous iteration. This step contains the bulk of the work in solving our finite difference equations. The M matrix can require a significant amount of computational memory to generate and to store, and inverting the M matrix can be a very computationally costly process. After we have our new flux solution, the next step is to update our system's eigenvalue estimate. We know that our flux for the n plus 1 iteration must satisfy the diffusion balance equation, and we can rearrange terms in this equation to solve for the n plus 1 eigenvalue estimate. Based on our previous step, we know that m phi of n plus 1 simply equals the fission source from the previous iteration. And so, we can estimate the eigenvalue for the n plus 1 iteration by taking the ratio of the fission source from this new iteration to the fission source from the previous iteration. After this step, we'll need to renormalize the flux and return to step two to continue iterating. But how do we know when our iteration cycle is complete and when our fluxes and eigenvalue have converged? We'll know if our iteration is converged by computing the relative error in the previous iteration's eigenvalue solution. This relative error should drop as we perform more and more iterations, and we can conclude that our iterations have converged drops below some threshold value epsilon. Most of the time, we don't only care about the system's eigenvalue, and we'll want to make sure that the localized fluxes are converged too. Thus, we'll also want to compute the relative error in the source term, which depends on the localized fluxes, for every cell in the problem. Once we have these source term relative errors for every cell, we'll continue iterating until each cell has a source term error that is below some threshold epsilon. And thus, we have explained the process for iterating for the eigenvalue and flux solution for any diffusion problem, regardless of what coordinate system we're operating in and how many dimensions are involved. The radiation transport field is filled with tips, tricks, and a lot of clever methods for accelerating convergence in these finite difference problems and for also improving their accuracy. One can spend their entire career researching and developing these kinds of methods. These finite element methods can also be extended to multi-group diffusion solutions, which is what we'll discuss in the very next lecture.